Uh, so thank you everyone for attending our last lecture in the series of human flourishing in a technological world. Um, as I've said every time, this is part of a research project uh, we've conducted for three years, uh, international scholars from various disciplines meeting to discuss the impact and nature of technology and uh, on human anthropology, on what it means to be human. And uh, today we're privileged to have uh, Dr. Brent Waters with us to do the last lecture. And uh, Dr. Waters is the kind of guy that will answer all of your questions that you hadn't been able to answer until now uh, in the final discussion period with the class. Um, I hope you haven't lost your sense of humor <coughs> during, the, during this whole Zoom session thing. Um, let me just briefly introduce Dr. Waters. He's the Jerry and Mary Joy Stead Professor of Christian Social Ethics at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Um, he is, uh, his work is focused on the domain of Christian ethics, where he pursues questions of moral life as is lived out in often ordinary and routine patterns of daily living. Um, Dr. Waters has written on transhumanism, has written on technoculture, um, on Christian moral theology and the emerging technoculture from post-human back to human is um, one of his books with Rutledge, 2016. Uh, all really good stuff. Um, the reason I, you know, I pulled uh, Dr. Waters into the research group was precisely because of these kind of works. Um, plus, he's also just a very good, it's a, a sane, a sane human being. So, um, Dr. Waters is going to speak to us today on the mundane and technology, what it means to be human. So, um, I'm really, really grateful and thankful, um, Brent, that you can join us. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jens. I, I wish I could be in Vancouver rather than doing this on the screen, but we'll do the best we can. And I'll, I'll pretend that I can smell the, the, the salmon barbecuing in the background. Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> it was good. <laughs> um, technology helps humans attain better health and material well-being. What I just said is a platitude. And like all platitudes, it contains an element of truth. Various diagnostic, preventive, and therapeutic technologies, for example, have improved healthcare, information, communication, transportation, and manufacturing. And these technologies have helped create unprecedented wealth, at least for those having the skills and access to compete in global markets. A platitude, however, also conceals the deceptions lurk lurking next to the truth that it reveals. A platitude tricks its audience into believing that the simple truth it conveys is all that matters. When deeper questions such, such as those of meaning are asked, they are relegated to moral or religious enclaves where they will not disturb the public square. In other words, if you have these kinds of questions, you're crazy. This facility to selectively disclose and disguise is why the platitude has been a favored tool of sophists throughout the ages. It is no different in the emerging technoculture that we late moderns inhabit. Despite any grumblings we might have about the costs and inefficiencies of healthcare providers, we are voracious consumers of almost any new drugs and medical procedures on offer. And as much as we may dislike the tycoons and pampered employees of Silicon Valley, we nonetheless turn to them to provide the devices we eagerly purchase and the surging stock valuations to enrich our investment portfolios. The benefits and thereby the truths of technology keep misgivings sequestered and under wraps. In this lecture, I assume that as late moderns, we live in an emergent technoculture. Technology is the totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity. That is Jacques Ellul's definition. And George Grant adds, in each lived moment of our waking and sleeping, we are technological civilization. I take it then that the benefits of the technoculture are easily recognized and well known. Consequently, I will not spend time describing the platitudinous truth of the emergent technoculture. You and I really should have no nostalgia for a past age. We live in a great time. And a lot of it 
has to do with the technology. But I will explore one of the sequestered questions. Although technology has admittedly improved physical and material well-being of humans, has it helped or hindered us in living a good life? Is the emergent technoculture promoting or obstructing human flourishing? Now, I have neither the time nor talent to answer this question fully, but instead today I will explore a few ideas and suggestions. First, some comments on human flourishing. Humans are embodied creatures. It is in and through bodies that humans live their lives. The notion of a disembodied person is best left to fanciful ghost stories and bad science fiction. Contrary to the dream of many transhumanists, a human cannot be reduced to digital information stored and then downloaded into artificial substrata. Since humans are embodied, they are also finite and mortal. Finitude refers to constraints against one's will that are largely imposed by the body, including the brain and the attendant mind. These constraints help determine who one becomes and what one does over time. Not just anyone, for instance, can be a professional athlete or a clever philosopher. Since humans are embodied, they are also mortal. Every person, at least to date, has a birth and a death. Although particulars vary, some individuals have long lives while others are short, and some die peacefully while others suffer, the pattern is always one of beginning, middle, and end. But it is a variable pattern in respect to time, and rife with both potential and constraints. The birth of every baby suggests the potential of something new, while, death, while every death frustrates the suggested novelty. Humans are also social creatures. Humans are drawn to associate with one another. Humans and hermits and recluses are rare, and ironically, they require a society from which to withdraw. People are drawn to one another partly out of necessity. They must cooperate and care for each other in order to survive. Yet people are also drawn to one another simply because we enjoy each other's company. To paraphrase scripture, it is not good to be alone. To flourish, humans must communicate, a word derived from the Greek term koinonia that can be translated as communicate, communion, or community. Humans may be said to thrive when they communicate with one another the goods of creation. In contrast to an exchange in which what is yours becomes mine and mine yours, Communication entails what is yours and what is mine becomes ours. Exchange, which is crucial in meeting physical and material needs, occurs predominantly in markets. Communication occurs primarily in associations such as families, churches, and voluntary organizations that are not predicated upon or, in a, or oriented toward exchange. Admittedly, communicative associations depend on exchange and are not immune from market forces, but they transcend them in meeting social and affiliative needs in ways that exchange cannot deliver. For example, genuine friendship cannot be bought or sold. In short, human flourishing occurs most prominently in communication because of the enduring reciprocity, mutuality, and intimacy and love they both require and, en and enrich factors that may be extant, but are not required to conduct market exchanges. People may say they love their work, but I doubt they are flourishing if all they do is work. For love, the love of God and neighbors are the rightful object of one's love. If humans as embodied finite and mortal creatures are to flourish then, they must attend to their basic physical and material needs. To be sure, technology is an excellent tool for meeting these needs, and there is no reason to challenge or belabor this point. But human flourishing is not confined to satisfying physical and material requirements. Social and affiliative needs must also be met. And here the role of technology plays, the role it plays is highly ambiguous. Does technology tend to enhance or does it tend to diminish communication and thereby human flourishing. 
Although communicative associations are essential to human flourishing, they are remarkably dull. The formative and sustaining fellowship afforded by these associations require a series of supportive acts, practices, and relationships that are invariably commonplace and repetitive. Moreover, they frequently prove tedious, monotonous, and mind-numbing, in a word, mundane, terribly mundane. The centrality of the mundane is not surprising. <clears throat> Maintaining a communicative association requires a lot of underlying hard work. Labor that is far from exciting and rarely rewarding in its own right. Take, for example, a family. At a bare minimum, shelter and sustenance is required. Maintaining a household, ensuring it is a fitting habitat for its residents, entires long hours of daily chores, endless tasks, and thankless errands. Rooms must be cleaned and clothes washed. Meals must be prepared and, mess, and the mess resulting from such meals cleaned up. <clears throat> Keeping the premises in good repair requires running countless errands to buy this and to buy that. Meeting the affiliative needs of family members also demands time and attention. Each day, spouses tend to each other in a plethora of both mundane and intimate ways. Parents make sure their children are fed, bathed, groomed, and well-rested, as well as monitoring their play and other activities. Families celebrate the accomplishments of their members and provide support when they fail. They keep company and they care for one another when they are sick. They communicate with each other their mutual belonging and their shared love and affection. A family, like any other communicative association, requires commonplace action if it is to promote the flourishing of its members. Much of this action is invariably routine, dull, and at times deadly dull, and almost always boring, yet absolutely essential. People do not flourish if they live in dilapidated or filthy environments, if they are not fed well and properly groomed and clothed, if they are ignored or worse, abused. To dismiss the mundane as unimportant is to virtually guarantee that humans will not flourish, at least to any significant extent. Even if one has sufficient means to pay others to accomplish the disagreeable chores and tasks of daily living, the point remains that they still must be done. It is in and through the commonplace circumstances of daily living <clears throat> that the bonds of imperfection are preserved and serve to promote our flourishing. Now to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the linchpin of, to one's flourishing is to become as dull and boring as possible. I'm not asking any of you to become a professor. Rather, I am suggesting that because humans are embodied, finite, finite mortal, and social creatures, their flourishing requires a great deal of maintenance that is inherently mundane. Yet the necessity of the mundane should not inspire either a disdainful or sentimental reaction. On the one hand, given the supportive status of the mundane, it should remain a peripheral concern. Peripheries are not unimportant, and attempts to ignore or denigrate the ordinary features of daily living, daily living or tantamount to expressing a Manichaean disdain for embodied existence. Curiously, flourishing would occur for these people if humans were emancipated from all the physical qualities that make us human, a fantasy promulgated these days by the transhumanist. On the other hand, to make the mundane the centerpiece of one's attention is self-defeating. The mundane is only a means and it is not an end. Rather, we attend to the commonplace in order to enable flourishing that to a limited extent transcends physical and material limits. Giving the mundane its due is to acknowledge the limits of embodied existence without thereby reducing people to their physicality or materiality. In short, humans are also more than their bodies. To state the matter succinctly, human flourishing requires work, dull, routine, ordinary labor, but it is a labor of neighbor love. We love our neighbors as embodied, finite, and mortal beings, and that is why we are also social creatures. We, we love one another in part through the ordinary tasks and chores we perform in behalf and for the sake of each other. 
Linking neighbor love in the mundane, however, is not a well-received message in the emerging technoculture. Late moderns tend to be shaped by and live in cultures that celebrate the extraordinary. The most prominent icons are extraordinary people who do extraordinary things. Celebrities, athletes, activists, entrepreneurs and the like are admired disruptors and influencers, the movers and the shakers. The masses are encouraged to follow their example for they are promised that they too can become extraordinary with the aid of technology. With the right software, for instance, virtually anyone with sufficient willpower, perseverance, or good luck can achieve great things. A homemade video goes viral. A YouTube channel gains a worldwide following. Widespread public demonstrations are organized through social media. Video game champions are lionized. The cult of the extraordinary is enabled by and in turn supports the emergent technoculture. Like all cults, it proclaims an element of truth. There is nothing inherently wrong with striving, striving to be extraordinary. And like all cults, it deceives. The purported extraordinariness fails to live up to what is promised. There is no reason to explore any further the element of truth, but identifying and assessing the deceptions is a more pressing and sent, is more pressing because they are subtle, even hidden. Three observations I'll use to illustrate. First, the promise of universal extraordinariness is a strategy doomed to fail. If everything and everyone is or has the potential to be extraordinary, then nothing or no one is or will be extraordinary. It is actually a disguised tactic to diminish rather than to elevate. Mediocrity masquerading as excellence is a default goal to be achieved. By its very nature, the extraordinary is rare and can only be recognized against the background of the ordinary. Second, attempting to transcend the ordinary turns out to be a leveling tactic. Everyone is deemed special, but no one stands out. Everybody receives a trophy or some recognition, so none, so none are of value. There is ostensible competition but no winners and losers, only participants. Indeed, anyone attempting to stand out from the leveling process of becoming extraordinary is frequently despised and derided as being uncooperative or worse, privileged. The cult of the extraordinary is ultimately intolerance and intolerance reinforced by information technology and social media because it is incapable of including genuine freedom within its homogenized categories of thought and expression. Ironically, efforts to differentiate excellence from mediocrity are threats to be resisted and dismantled. It is amazing how a chorus of self-proclaimed extraordinary voices sound routinely the same and conventional. Third, the cult of the extraordinary effectively denigrates the ordinary. The emergent technoculture has little use for the mundane. The patterns of daily living, living are most often ignored and when given attention are usually dismissed as objects of scorn and ridicule. Such activities as cleaning, washing, repairing, and the like are simply a waste of time. Taking one away from, <clears throat> from being entertained or creatively expressing oneself. Hannah Arendt shows a distinct, uh, drew a distinction between work and labor. To overgeneralize, work is a product of the mind, a book or a painting, for example, whereas labor involves physical effort in response to natural necessity, constructing a building or harvesting a field. To overgeneralize again, the emergent technoculture loves work, but it hates labor. The principal benefit of technology is that it simultaneously frees people from labor while also enabling their work. Labor saving devices, for instance, allows more screen time for productive or leisurely work. Such a distinction is at the very best hypocritical, for it fails to recognize that one's liberation from labor remains dependent on the labor of others. Devices must still be manufactured, assembled and transported, laborious tasks that must be accomplished by someone. 
and these laborers are virtually invisible to the unaware beneficiaries of technology. Think for a moment of all the invisible people you never see when you click buy this product on a website. Beyond the hypocrisy, however, there is the more troubling denigration of the mundane. Tending to the myriad needs of embodied, finite, and mortal people, ourselves and our neighbors, is perceived as an assault against human dignity. Despite rhetoric often praising the sensual pleasures of embodied existence, the accompanying constraints and deterioration are deeply resented. In short, late moderns tend to loathe their bodies. This loathing is seen in extreme reaction. reactions. The health of one's own body may be ignored or become the object of obsessive monitoring. And the care of embodied neighbors, especially loved ones, is a source of incessant anxiety or they are casually relegated to the care of specialized professionals and institutions. For late moderns, the body is not regarded as an object of care and solicitude, but a problem to be solved. Yet it is proving to be an insoluble problem. Technology has generally mitigated finitude and mortality through improved preventive, diagnostic, and therapeutic techniques. People with access to excellent health care tend to live longer and healthier lives. Yet finitude and mortality have not been overcome, and that horizon appears to be far, far away. Despite the misleading transhumanist rhetoric that has leached into medicine, aging is not a disease that can eventually be cured. For a few Promethean transhumanists, technology is the great hope for solving the problem of embodiment. But for most, technology is a distraction that keeps the problem at bay, at least for a while. If the emergent technoculture simultaneously supports the cult of the extraordinary while disparaging the mundane, then it, turn, turn, then it in turn weakens the prospect of human flourishing. This, dis this diminishment, however, is unobvious. Proponents contend that individuals benefit from progressive and innovative technological development. Whatever problems may emerge, they can be tweaked or corrected. The internet, for instance, enables users to contact people at remote locations, stay informed, take online courses, and complete tran commercial transactions quickly and efficiently. Problems such as online bullying, fake news, privacy violations, and hacking occur, but these are remedied through better regulation and improved security. In short, more screen time enhances one's well-being. In contrast, critics have a harder time demonstrating the liabilities. Romantic appeals to nature and saving the environment have their charm, but people live increasingly in cities and suburbs. The emergent technoculture envelops everyone within overlapping social, economic, and political systems that are nearly inescapable. As witnessed by the numerous websites dedicated to saving the earth or a failure ensures offering tips for living in a post-apocalyptic world. In other words, there is now a website which urges you to stay off websites. To a significant extent, the emerging technoculture encapsulates in a concrete manner Martin Heidegger's notion of enframement as a way that a society reveals what it is and what it aspires to become. And to enframe is to also entrap. Heidegger, Heidegger, however, goes too far. He implies that the emergent technoculture is a sinister social and political apparatus designed to enslave hapless people, intimating that it has taken on a life of its own that cannot be controlled. A culture, however, does not have a life of its own, but reflects the lives, values, and choices of its participants. Granted, some are better positioned than others to influence a culture, but if the enframement <clears throat> of the emerging technoculture is as controlling as Heidegger contends, then it is the product of someone's scheming and manipulation. That is a ludicrous suggestion, for it would entail a conspiracy of such unprecedented magnitude and unlikely proficiency that not even the clever wizards of Silicon Valley in league with their financial and political minions are smart enough to achieve. The emergent technoculture is menacing human flourishing, not because of some evil intent, but 
something more akin to an unintended consequence. No technological pro project designed to achieve a good end can perceive every contingent outcome, some of which are unwanted or even malevolent. These are not simply problems that can be solved without destroying the project. For example, in the late 20th century, who imagined that the new information superhighway would be littered with off ramps and side roads leading to pornography, consumer fraud, identity theft, and the like? No amount of regulation or technical fixes will ever make the World Wide Web entirely safe, and its users are forced to cope with various risks. And cope they will, since a vast array of information and communication technologies have become intertwined with the daily lives of countless individuals. To recognize that the emergent technoculture is not necessarily friendly to human flourishing is not to see some monolithic wicked force. Rather, it is to encounter a series of unintended consequences that distract attention away from those things and actions that promote our flourishing. To flourish requires remaining focused on the outcomes of the ordinary and the mundane. How does technology distract? Primarily by offering substitutes to the, mundane, to the mundane that are more interesting, less demanding, and easier to control. Sherry Turkle insists that various digital and robotic technologies offer an illusion of intimacy and minimal risk relationships that a growing number of people prefer. In her words, I find people willing to seriously consider robots not only as pets, but as potential friends, confidants, and even romantic partners. For many people, robots are preferable because they are more reliable and they do not disappoint. Some teenagers and young adults, for instance, believe that robots would provide superior advice and counsel than other humans with limited databases. Human fallibility is a liability best avoided. Machines are more trustworthy than humans for guiding behavior because it is assumed that human action can be reduced to information and machines are much more adept at managing data than their human counterparts. In short, machines are simply more trustworthy. This growing fondness and dependency on technology is not as innocent as might first appear. Various digital and robotic technologies reduce identity to performance and performance, at least in the virtual world, is manufactured, mastered, and refined. Technology creates and it reinforces the illusion that humans can recreate themselves in virtual space. Turkle asks, does virtual intimacy degrade our experience of the other kind, and indeed of all encounters of any kind? She contends that the devices on offer at least imply a degraded intimacy. Sociable robots and online life both suggest the possibility of relationships the way we want them. On Facebook, for example, we present ourselves the way we want to be and not necessarily the way we are. Consequently, late moderns tend to feel disconnected and disoriented without their devices and gadgets, for they both shape and express their identities. Again, in Turkle's words, gradually we come to see our online life as life itself. To state the matter succinctly, technology proposes itself as the architect of our intimacies. These days it suggests substitutions that put the real on the run. It is dangerous to put the real on the run. A few instances will suffice to illustrate the hazard. The first casualty is a decline of alterity, the ability to perceive the other as other. The more that people immerse themselves in digital technologies, the more they are inclined to perceive others as extensions of themselves. This retreat from the other is dangerous, for in the absence of alterity, there can be no empathy. Empathy is crucial because it provides a foundation of morality in which the other is treated as another subject and not an object. Or in theological terms, alterity and empathy are prerequisites for fulfilling the command to love one's neighbor. Yet in the realm of digital technologies, there are no real neighbors, only screens upon which to project oneself. 
Some, especially the young and the old, are coming to prefer, prefer robotic and virtual companions because they are safer, less irksome, and subject to one's control. They are, in short, much easier to deal with than other embodied beings. Robots do not bully, and Turkle reports how a grandmother prefers the company of her robotic pet to her granddaughter. And such companions make it easier for adult children to emotionally abandon their aging parents with a clean conscience. Even in social media that purportedly enhances contact among humans belies the ease that others are manipulated or ignored. It takes little effort and minimal emotional distress to quickly friend and unfriend online, for the so-called friend is little more than a name, perhaps a photo, and a hyperlink. <clears throat> Although technology may appear to meet our affiliative needs, the appearance deceives. Online friendships may be easier and less threatening, but they are not intimate. Robotic companions listen, but they cannot hear. They appear to be concerned about our welfare, but are unable to care. We are promised that so-called online communities are supportive, but what is offered is no community at all. In genuine, that is, embodied communities, the good and the bad are inseparable, for example, as in people and events, and hence the necessity of mutual support and forbearance. In an online community, the subjectively determined bad is removed at one's will or whim. Cumulatively, living in the emergent technoculture is to live in the simulacra of realities fabricated from one's own diminished imagination. Moreover, it is a fabricated world in which we flatter ourselves as rightfully belonging in the center. It is therefore hazardous for a fabricated life secluded from an objectively real world. It is dangerous because it feeds, in Iris Murdoch's words, the fat, relentless ego, which is the enemy of the moral life. The emergent technoculture is effectively indifferent perhaps inimical to human flourishing because it distracts attention away from the vital foundation of the mundane. It is through the mundane that we learn to care for ourselves and others as creatures bound together by our shared bonds of imperfection. To accept ourselves and others, however, as embodied and social creatures is to also embrace finite and mortal constraints that define and limit our actions for the good of ourselves and the good of our neighbors. Yet accepting the necessity of limits in order to flourish is anathema to the core tenet of the emergent technoculture, namely that with sufficient technological development, virtually any problem can be solved and any desire fulfilled, or at least the experience of such solutions and satiated desire can be satisfactorily fabricated. To believe that experience is an adequate substitute for reality is to entertain a perilous illusion. For indulgent fantasies, for indulging fantasies almost invariably harms oneself and others. As Turkle remarked, technology has put the real on the run. We need to ask how we might go about putting technology on the run, especially if human flourishing is at stake. Iris Murdoch offers some promising answers. According to Murdoch, we need a realist perception and understanding of the world, a world that is not merely an artifact of our imagination. And we must see and deal with the world as it is and not how we might prefer it to be. Such realism is needed to prevent humans from slipping into personal fantasies, the nemesis of moral excellence. Fantasizing reduces the world and neighbors to constructs, subject to one's manipulation, since they are ultimately projected objects with no substantial reality of their own. But the fantasy is a lie, originating in and reinforcing the fat, relentless ego. The world and the neighbor are objective realities in their own right, possessing their respective needs and goods that fantasies allow one to ignore. Such willful ignorance is motivated more by an existential romantic provocation rather than a search for, for truth. A malady which, 
the idea of goodness and or virtue has been largely superseded in Western moral philosophy by the idea of rightness, supported perhaps by some conception of sincerity. In other words, it doesn't matter what is believed as long as it is believed sincerely. Similarly, Arendt warns that late moderns are virtually incapable of seeing the world and therefore the roles within it, or at least seeing it very clearly because technology serves to conceal those realities behind a mask of creative mastery. <clears throat> Tools and instruments ease pain and effort and thereby change the modes in which the urgent necessity inherent in labor once was manifest to all. They do not change the necessity itself. They only serve to hide it from our senses. Labor that was once grounded in a response to natural necessity is now devoted to preserving the primacy of human artifice, reinforcing the technological sleight of hand. The constructs that humans occupy in the emergent technoculture are semblances of debased notions of truth, hiding an underlying will to power. Moreover, these semblances are not confined to fabricating an external world, but include concocting oneself, as reflected in the modern philosophy, beginning with Hegel, that has succumbed to the strange illusion that humans, in distinction from other things, have created themselves. Since maintaining the semblance of a world and its inhabitants demands increasing time and effort, attention has shifted away from the mundane that is grounded in necessity and reality, and is now simply kept away through the technical prowess of our, of our gadgets. But nonetheless, they retain sufficient vigor to periodically remind humans of their finitude and mortality. The emergent technoculture reinforces perceptions and action that distracts humans away from the ordinary, thereby stripping them of the very condition they require to flourish. If the allure and distractions of the emergent technoculture are as pervasive as I contend, can attention be redirected toward the necessity of the ordinary in order to strengthen the prospect of human flourishing? <clears throat> the short answer is yes. Murdoch submits that the solution is to find a moral philosophy in which the concept of love, so rarely mentioned now by philosophers, can once again be made central. Murdoch is trying to recover a general metaphysical background to morals as the reliable foundation for a realist moral imagination. The good that humans should seek to know and to do is not something they construct, but is an objective reality. Normative claims should thereby be closely related to descriptive discourse about this given world, rather than imperative rhetoric trying to create one. At this point, you might be wondering, to use Tina Turner's uh, line, what's love got to do with it? Love often misconstrued, is often misconstrued as a wildly capricious emotion, but it provides the most reliable lens for seeing the world and our neighbors objectively. Love, not reason or science, is the best bulwark against distractive fantasies. A true love of the other, as other, cannot be divorced from the necessity of the ordinary, for it is in and through the mundane that we come to learn and to attend to the needs and goods of one another, of the ones that we love. Murdoch insists, love is knowledge of the individual. This knowledge, however, is not abstract, it is concrete. We come to know and relate to others as unique and imperfect people who steadfastly defy any and all attempts to categorize and generalize except in su superficial ways. We do not love people in general. We love particular persons. This does not mean that human action, especially moral action, is arbitrary. The good in particular, the good of ourselves and others, is not whatever we say it is. Rather, there is a transcendent moral reality that can be known, however vague and imperfectly our perceptions may prove to be. To borrow from St. Paul, we see in a mirror vaguely but we do, or at least we can see. 
moral knowledge and action then <clears throat> is more akin to seeing than thinking. A disciplined knowledge shaped by the affections rather than divorced from them. Yet moral knowledge of and action directed toward other particular persons nonetheless refers to concrete universals. A universality that comes from seeing the world and our neighbors truthfully. Murdoch insists that we come to see this reality that is simultaneously universal in particular by casting a loving, just, and prolonged gaze on reality, by fixing our attention upon the, re the real instead of a fantasy. Consequently, moral language and action depends on context of attention. In her words, I can only choose within the world I can see, in the moral sense of see, which implies that clear vision is a result of moral imagination and moral effort. <clears throat> One important result of this seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, is to understand moral categories in action in more dynamic ways, extending over time, even lifetimes. Freedom, for instance, is primarily the outcome of attention and not action. The freedom which is a proper human goal is the freedom from fantasy, that is the realm of compassion. Fantasy is rooted in self-centeredness, whereas attention to reality is derived from love of the other. Genuine freedom is more like a truthful vision than an assertive will. Activism as a willful act often degenerates into mindless slogans or senseless, senseless rage because it is blind to the reality it purportedly wishes to change. It unwittingly slips into more familiar tactic of concocting and imposing an alternative reality that is grounded in little more than the fickle will of protesters or worse, the riotous mob. But the actions undertaken by the zealous and imposed upon their unwilling neighbors is anything but free because it is action stemming from the mistaken premise of the superiority of the will to power over the love of neighbor. The misguided preference for the extraordinary rather than the ordinary. As Murdoch insists, the moral life is formed continually and not confined to a few choices or acts, for love endures and is only effectual over time. A problem, and there are probably many more, but I can only deal with one, looms that must be addressed, at least in the time remaining. If the moral life is akin to seeing the good within the real, won't well, any attempt to direct one's attention on the reality of the world and our neighbors prove to be a fool's errand, since the fat, relentless eagle always distracts us away from remaining focused on the task at hand? Well, yes, so the ego must be put on a diet. To declare, I am not the center of the universe is evident. Nonetheless, we often act as if this were the case. We act in ways calculated to inflate our sense of self-importance in the eyes of others, and we expect that others should serve our interests. Indeed, we may treat others well only to the extent that we perceive it will somehow benefit us. At its most extreme, this selfish orientation effectively reduces others to a means of, of self-pleasure uh, and aggrandizement rather than as other persons. A proper self-regard is not the issue. Morality, for instance, is implausible without personal agency or self-awareness. And even a properly ordered self-love is recommended by scripture. A neighbor cannot be loved and served by a non-self. The self, however, must transcend itself to love and serve the neighbor. Neighbor love, to use a crude analogy, does not seek to draw the other into one's orbit, but is drawn outward to the other as another I, another person to whom in virtue of our shared being, I am related to, but who is also different than me. Why is this self-transcendence crucial? How can it be accomplished? How can ordinary deeds and relationships help us shrink the ego? Iris Murdoch is acutely aware of this difficult challenge. She attempts to solve the problem of the self, especially in respect to ethics, through her concept of unselfing. 
For Murdoch, freedom is a core human trait and value that does not consist of an isolated individual leaping in and out of impersonal logical complex. It is a function of the progressive attempt to see a particular object clearly. Love is central to the process of going, gaining clarity. It is in loving the world as an objective reality in general, and other people in particular, that we come to see both more clearly in their own respective right. For in so doing, we apprehend their own and related goodness that belong to a continuous fabric of being. This attentive love can prompt a process of unselfing, wherein the lover learns to see and cherish and respect what is not oneself. If I attend properly, I will have no choice, and this is the ultimate condition to be aimed at. The ideal situation is similar kind of necessity. Freedom is not impeded movement, but is similar to the notion of obedience. Consequently, the moral life is something that is formed continually and not confined to relatively few moments of isolated decision. How does unselfing create a space for seeing the world and our neighbors more clearly? By ensuring that the space is predicated upon the centrality of love. When love is properly ordered, it is directed outwardly, allowing the other to be. Whereas when love is improperly directed inwardly, it shapes the other into an artifact of the will. To oversimplify, a love that is exclusively directed inwardly is disordered. The consequence of this disordered love is significant. The will to reshape the other feeds the ego relentlessly, diminishing the center of reality to the one willing and controlling. The centering of the ego is, of course, illusory, and such a fantasy, per Murdoch, is a nemesis of moral excellence. A fantasized self is incapable of attending to the other, and thereby, thereby cannot know the good of the other. The other is good only insofar as the value it is assigned by the one seeking to shape the other for its own sake. This lack of loving unself attention exposes the fantasy or the fallacy rather of the disordered perception of love as needing no space for the freedom which is proper human goal is the freedom from fantasy. Fantasy is rooted in self-centeredness whereas attending to the reality of, of the other as other is derived from love. Reality, one that is given and engaged rather than constructed and manipulated, is the proper object of love, and knowledge of the object is liberating. It is in this knowledge that we can will to love the neighbor as another person with his or her own inherent good. Moreover, as only as finite and mortal beating, beings that we perceive and attend to the good of other finite and mortal beings. Although Murdoch is an astute philosopher, she is also a gifted novelist. She wrote 25 novels. In her fiction, she frequently portrays the necessity of unselfing for morality, and her characters demonstrate many failed and some occasional successful attempts at unselfing. Her stories are not populated with bigger than life characters, but ordinary ones living commonplace lives. She describes their mundane actions and relationships in exquisite detail, and the resulting literary portraits are starkly realistic. This real world, as one might expect, is often hopelessly muddled because the characters cannot see beyond themselves. Consequently, all of Murdoch's characters are focused or forced to concentrate on ordinary action in a world where muddle reigns. Her novels disclose a spiritual quest for an objective good in the world, but one that eludes most people. The principal reason why most of Murdoch's characters fail to see the good is that they overlook or are unable to focus on the details of their world and those inhabiting it, preferring instead to create fantasies of larger than life worlds. As Murdoch depicts it, Neglect of detail occurs because characters are blinded by the pursuit of large and glorious, utterly false ideal, and this neglect leads in inevitably to defeats and the misuse of others. To know and love the world and those residing in it requires focused, unselfed attention. 
And I think there is nothing that more focuses this attention than mundane activities, because we cannot deal with them clearly unless we can see what is needed. And so properly ordering the space between the lover and beloved is the task. For love is somewhat like a Goldilocks principle. One cannot be too close and one cannot be too far, but just right in order to see the good of the other with greatest clarity. The mundane can help create a mund and, cr and maintain this space by shrinking the fat, relentless ego. There is nothing more unself-oriented than being focused on serving the needs of others, and also nothing more humbling. Changing an infant's diaper. How can a cute baby create such foul stench? Bringing a glass of water to a sick spouse. Running an errand at a most inopportune hour. These are simple acts that certainly serve the needs of neighbors. They are also certainly boring. There is nothing inherently good about being bored. But boredom has its values because it does stimulate the imagination. Waiting can assist on selfing because we learn to wait both for something or someone to come, something to happen. And we also wait on others as in providing a service. In boredom, we do learn something about patience. And so the task of unselfing is not an easy one in the emergent technoculture because it is not seen as having any value whatsoever. The purpose of the emerging technoculture is not to unself, but to inflate the self as much as possible. Yet, I think re remaining faithful to the principle of unselfing will include adapting a variety of strategies and pra practices, some succeeding, others failing. Yet, I think it is worth the effort, for in avowing the mundane, we protect ourselves and our neighbors from distracting and deadly fantasies in order that we might flourish in a real world that we learn to love. And we will flourish as embodied, finite, immortal creatures, flourish as the ordinary creatures that we are and that we were created to be. Thank you.